She actually made an attempt to go out on stage. And she was obviously not herself and not, not able to do it. So it, it finished at that point. I'd never been afraid of anything. Now I was afraid. And I had nightmares for so many years afterwards, you wouldn't believe it. It just didn't go away. Connie Francis became a recluse. She spent most of her time reading letters from other assault victims. In mid-1975, her lawyer discovered that Howard Johnson's had not even fixed the lock in the room where she was assaulted. Connie brought a lawsuit against the chain and won the largest personal injury settlement up to that time. The case also inspired a reform in hotel and motel security. Although they won, the strain tore Connie and Joe's marriage apart. And I think an incident like that either brings the couple close together or it splits them apart. And in their case, it split them. The only bright spot in this period was the adoption Connie and Joe had pursued for months. I think without Joey, I definitely would have committed suicide right after the rape. I really do. For four years, Connie hid from the public eye, focusing only on raising Joey. She's really geared towards academics, so we did a lot of academic stuff. Um, just, we would, she would just, I remember she'd drill me on vocab words, stuff like that. Sit down, do my homework with me after school. In this difficult period, Joey was all she had. And I would go to my basement, which was soundproof, and I would yell out a song like, Where the Boys Are. And what the sounds that emanated from my throat were so alien to me. I said, and, and, and it was not there. Something that always had always been there for me was not there. And I took all of my records that night and all of everybody else's records, including Bobby's records, and I burned them in three garbage cans outside my house. She was known now as the woman who was raped rather than the number one female vocalist in the world. And she said, how could you say that? And I said, because it stopped you from singing. If you had gone on back to work, people would have forgotten about it. Seven take two. Longtime friend Dick Clark knew Connie needed to be on stage again, even if she could barely sing. She painfully recorded fragments, later edited together so she could lip sync. 16 top 10 records, the world's number one female vocalist when she elected to stop performing. Everybody in the world has begged this lady to come back. And frankly, she turned us all down. But tonight is the night. She is back. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Connie Francis. <laughs> at the old tape of the show, we both cried at the end of it because it was magnificent. Standing ovation, people loved her, wanted her back, and it was a, a very memorable moment. Buoyed by her success, Connie underwent a series of operations to repair her botched nose job. As she made plans for a comeback, she was faced with yet another tragedy. She lost her younger brother. George Francanero Jr. had been convicted twice of fraud, but had gotten immunity for offering testimony about organized crime. My brother grew up into adulthood needing to feel important. My father was oblivious to him, and I always regret that. He made an attempt to be recognized, you know, to be respected in his own right. I mean, he loved her, and he certainly didn't, you know, didn't um, deny her the fame that she had. I mean, he was just thrilled for her. 
the year of her brother's murder, Connie Francis found her voice accompanying the car radio to the song, What I Did for Love. She called her manager, and her manager called back the next day and said, Connie, unfortunately, Carnegie Hall is not available. But I don't know how you're going to react to this. Westbury is. It was the same stage where the music had ended seven years before. She began the show with the disco anthem, I Will Survive. Back in the public eye, Connie devoted a new manic energy to creating support for victims of violent crime, especially rape victims. In this country, one out of four girls can expect to be harassed or sexually assaulted before she reaches the age of 18. My name is Connie Francis. I think this is scary and an outrage, don't you? For a free copy of what you should know about rape, call the New She York took her campaign to Washington, where Ronald Reagan's administration formed a task force around Connie that did nothing. Instead, she worked with local law enforcement to adopt a Crime Victims' Bill of Rights, which was posted in local stations. It was a great, great time of her life that uh, she did really accomplish something that it was, is here to stay. Five, two, four. Connie's high energy had a darker side. Incoherent late night phone calls to friends, paranoid death threats, and shopping sprees of hundreds of thousands of dollars. We shopped. We shopped a lot. And we used to come home, we used to hide things from her mother. So her mother wouldn't know how much shopping we did. Once again, George Francanero stepped in and took control. In August of 1983, he had his daughter handcuffed and forcibly institutionalized for manic depression. In a way, if Elvis Presley had had people around him that loved him, that loved him, he, he, perhaps he'd be alive today. Uh, and love isn't always saying yes. For Connie Francis, it was simply the latest instance of George Francanero controlling his 42-year-old daughter's life. She vowed never to speak to him again. Continues here on Biography. By the mid-1980s, Connie Francis was a bittersweet reminder of simpler times. Her 25-year addiction to pills, combined with the trauma of the 1974 rape, had triggered severe bouts of mental illness. In 1985, she was escorted off a Delta Airlines plane by police when she refused to extinguish a cigarette. I am to leave the plane immediately at the behest of the two pilots who are ticked off because I called them dopes or jerks because I don't say hello to people or answer questions by passengers, okay? And if I don't do that, uh, people are going to come, like the police department, and pull me off the plane. Okay, I'll wait here because I'm not leaving this plane. I paid for my ticket and I've done nothing wrong. And when she was in a manic state, there was no telling, you know, what she was going to do, who she was going to call, or... It was just tough. It was tough controlling her. She swung from depressive lows so severe they required shock treatments to manic highs in which she made occasional public appearances. Mr. Flick, you fit, you're a ruling guy. I'd like to clip your wings so you can fly. you know she had peaks here and there she would have a number one record in brazil with stupid cupid and then um just little things here and there so that she was never really out of the charts somewhere in the world. Connie's fans all over the world treasured these few appearances. Some of them became like an extended family. Some even won the confidence of her estranged father. We sat at a, at a table having coffee one day and he says, "My our daughter was just born. She was a toddler. He says, Mike, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to bring your daughter up too hard, you know. Off stage, Connie didn't recognize her own problems. 
and those around her thought it was simply the behavior of a temperamental celebrity. Her father called her the Queen. That was his nickname for her, Queenie. And uh, that's the way it was. She called the shots. And, you know, even as close as we were, we still, there was still some awe. In 1985, Connie married for the fourth time to television producer Bob Parkinson and moved to California. This marriage lasted only 81 days. After the divorce, an old friend in Los Angeles had to cope with her manic depression. Another friend and I had to have her committed. It was a very difficult, awful, probably one of the worst experiences I had in my life. We had to, under California law, get her to strike out at one or the other of us. And so we played good cop, bad cop. I was the good guy, so hopefully she would hit the other guy. We were eventually able to get her to a state, not get her to, but have her uh, violate the law, technically, so that she could then be taken to get help. In 1989, doctors found the right combination of medication and dosage. Stabilized by lithium, Connie began to think of another comeback. We were attending a concert one night. Uh, Wayne Newton was appearing at the Diplomat Hotel. She leaned over and whispered in my ear and she said, I think it's time for me to go back to work. And we were like so overjoyed. And after the show, we went up to see Wayne in his room. And the minute the door opened, he said, lady, you belong on stage. The bells were ringing. You sure were the guy. The hearts were singing. Every Susan sound. When you sang, we're going to build a little home. Connie and her father declared a truce. Now in his late 70s, George Frankenero was battling a number of illnesses. His daughter finally forgave him for committing her. It was very irritating, I'll tell you the truth, because he was always right. But in retrospect, I'm glad he was right. It would have been worse if he were wrong. In late 1996, George was on his deathbed. Connie was scheduled to perform in Tampa. The promoters threatened to sue if she did not appear. And now he, at this point, is barely conscious. And she goes to him to tell him what's happening. And he said, Connie, go do the show. And uh, the nurses and the doctors said, he is very, very weak. But he will wait for her. <laughs> George Francanero died on October 15, 1996. Connie still performs occasionally, though she must cycle off her lithium to do so. It's a trade-off. I mean, she needs the medication to be level, but there's no energy. Uh, very often, the doctors stop the medication. The Connie Francis voice that we all know, you get it. But she pays a price. She performs in smaller halls that cater to those who remember or want to recapture the golden age of 1950s pop music. Connie Francis is a survivor, and don't we all admire that? Are we not all survivors in one way or another? A movie version of Connie Francis's life has been talked about and yet never made. But at least one superstar has stated publicly that she would jump at the chance to play her. Gloria Estefan, who recently made her big screen debut in Music of the Heart, told Us magazine that her dream role would be to play Connie Francis. She had so much drama in her life, Estefan says, and there's something about that song, Where the Boys Are, that gets me every time. As for Connie, she celebrated her 61st birthday on Sunday and still performs live occasionally, much to the delight of her ever-loyal fans. 
tomorrow on Biography.